Okay, so the uh, the next part that we're going to talk about uh, is evasion of the immune response. So I need to kind of introduce um, that. Uh, animals like us uh, as well have cells called phagocytes. They're along with our first line of defense. Um, they are more generic uh, in terms of what they're going to bind to, so they don't necessarily have a very uh, specific cell that they're after, um, uh, but they can recognize things as typically being foreign, uh, as not being part of you. Uh, and what those cells are going to do, at least as they're going to attempt to do, is find those cells, and then they're going to start to engulf those cells, and eventually they would make a vesicle around those foreign cells and pull them inside. Once they were inside the cell, oh, actually, maybe I'll, I'll do it over here. So if this is the, um, the phagocyte, the phagocyte would start to pull in like this, the bacterial cell, say the invading cell, uh, and then it, eventually it would form a, a vesicle. Right? So you would end up getting this vesicle in the cell with the bacteria inside it. That structure would then bind to a lysosome. This is going to be important for what we're going to talk about here. Um, which typically has a very low pH, very acidic, has, and it's going to have enzymes in it that are digestive. And so they would bind together and form a structure called a phagosome, which would break down and destroy the bacteria. That would That's usually the first sort of thing that can happen unless the bacteria can prevent that from happening through evasion. So some bacteria can simply avoid um, the phagocytes. They can essentially hide out uh, from them. They could remain in some tissues that the phagocytes don't enter. Um, and they could just stay away from them in general. So they can kind of do their thing, invade the tissue, um, but stay away from areas where the phagocytes are. That's not going to be that effective um, for really penetrating into the host or spreading very far. Uh, the further they spread, then the more likely they're going to encounter the phagocytes. Uh, but that is one strategy. So potentially just, just avoid them outright uh, as far as the evasion goes. Next step is you can uh, inhibit engulfment. So when the phagocyte's going to start to engulf or phagocytize um, the bacterial cell, some can prevent that uh, or stop it from happening. Some can actually use uh, specific chemicals, uh, so it's chemically mediated process that might block that from happening and prevent the cell from being able to actually uh, engulf them. The next step would be, if they can't avoid them and they can't stop being engulfed, uh, is simply um, to survive. Survive um, the phagosome. So once the bacterial cell has been engulfed and pulled inside uh, the phagocyte and the lysosome would go to bind, uh, then this particular cell has a, an ability to do a number of different things. Um, one is that it could actually block lysosome fusion. so that the lysosome can't actually attach uh, to that vesicle and then release the enzymes that would cause it to be uh, destroyed. Um, the other is it can actually escape. So it can release its own enzymes uh, that it can use to attack and destroy um, the vesicle and potentially even get out or destroy or damage the cell itself uh, from the other way around. So that's also a possibility uh, for some, which kind of leads to the last one, uh, which is, which is part of that survival might be to kill the phagocyte. So um, this means that the, the 
bacteria is using its own toxin. So kind of like this one. Use its own toxin on the phagocyte. And then escape. So that's possible. A number of different bacteria that use some or all of these uh, strategies in some in some way to avoid being detected, to avoid being uh, captured, or to escape once they are captured uh, and inhibit that process from occurring. So the your immune system can't really deal with them at least at this particular level um, from the sort of more generic phag uh, phagocytes. Uh, and then what we'll need are other cells to come in, which we will talk about later, um, which might be a little more specific in terms of their binding for this particular pathogen, uh, and it'll then capture it in a way that it won't be able to, to escape. So, um, and we talked about some of those enzymes I brought in before. Uh, I said that the bacterial cells will have some of these enzymes that can lyse then these, uh, the host cells. Um, break down and destroy the cells, these would be some of the same types of enzymes they could use to escape, get out from, or kill the phagocytes, the ones that are coming after them. So they could use, use it in the, the same way. In that line, all right, not just talking about killing the phagocytes, but in general, um, all the host, you know, or any host cell or any tissue that they're in, um, we get into that, this toxigenesis part. Okay, so the toxins. We're going to be two major classes of toxins. We're going to have uh, proteins and lipopolysaccharides. Now, in general, what we tend to do is, so I'm going to erase this hopefully quickly. Uh, in general, uh, we categorize the proteins into a group that we call exotoxins. And we typically categorize the uh, lipopolysaccharides, or uh, if you remember this from the gram-negative cell wall, we call it the LPS, um, lipopolysaccharide. LPS layer on the outside of the gram-negative bacteria uh, is typically uh, a type of toxin. And I'm going to get into what and how they might affect the, the host cells. So uh, we might put them into one of these two categories. Well, they are going to be put into one of these two categories based on their um, chemical makeup. In general, the proteins tend to be called exotoxins. And they tend to be released from the cells. They are usually. Uh, highly potent or highly virulent. With usually, say, very low LD50 values. Remember what I talked about before? So very s small amounts of these chemicals can be very effective at harming the host cells, incredibly damaging, uh, even with really small amounts. They are, that looked weird, uh, GH, highly. Um, they are heat sensitive, though. So um, increasing temperature can destroy or denature these molecules because they're proteins and they would lose their function and their effectiveness as a toxin and not, not do anything. So boiling or heating up these chemicals would destroy them. So if uh, bacteria contaminated food um, and then the food was cooked properly and there were these toxins present, the toxins all should be destroyed by the heating process. If it was not heated or cooked properly, then the, um, the chemical molecules could remain. Uh, in addition to that, uh, these have a, a strong ability to interact with uh, antibodies. So um, they're, they have a, they're highly, what's called highly, again, GH, highly antigenic, I mean, they, they will bind really well to um, a variety of antibodies, or there are antibodies specifically to bind to these molecules, where that's not always the case with all, all the different types of, uh, of molecules that are toxins. Um, something else. Oh, typically also, this one thing I put here is uh, typically no fever induction. So if you are 
infected with an organism and that organism uh, is making you ill, um, but does not induce fever, likely the chemical involved in that process is an exotoxin uh, versus the other, which we'll get into, which usually does induce fever, the endotoxins. So endotoxins are LPS, the lipopolysaccharides. So generally gram negative cell wall, the outer layer. Now exotoxins could be in gram positive or gram negative organisms. Um, they're released from the, the proteins that are released from the cell. That's why they're called exotoxins. You released. Uh, and it could be from either either type. But it's the gram negative ones that will have the LPS. Gram positive definitely uh, do not have an LPS layer. It's not part of their characteristic. Uh, these are more heat stable. So heating it up, even boiling, may not destroy these. So again, uh, food contaminated with a bacteria that has the endotoxins, you may kill the bacteria by heating it up, but not destroy the toxins. So in eating that, you would still become ill, equally as ill as if the bacteria were alive. It, it doesn't matter if the bacteria is alive or dead, you would still be affected by these uh, endotoxins. Um, in addition to being heat, they are, they are not really antigenic. And, uh, uh, but they will interact with the mechanisms that induce fever. So typically, uh, if you do get a fever, it's highly likely you're infected with a bacteria that has an endotoxin uh, that is inducing that fever response. Um, typically, they are much less potent or less virulent. meaning that often while they make their host uh, ill, um, I want to say it's rare, but it, it, usually not, not as likely to in, cause death of their host from an infection um, as in exotoxin. Exotoxins are, are very potent, very small amounts, and, and are potentially more likely to kill the host. Uh, endotoxins will make you ill, but uh, usually not in an extreme sort of way. Um, usually they're uh, involved a lot with gastrointestinal distress, um, so making you, you nauseous uh, and, and sick, but, but that would be the, the extent of it. So that's going to be kind of the main thing. That's going to be it for um, talking about pathogenesis. Now, there's a lot more details and all kind of very specific examples and names of molecules that could be gone into, but what we're doing is just really going over the, uh, the overview of the topic, the terms, and the process. So uh, we kind of have uh, pathogens, the disease-causing organisms. In this particular case, we're talking about bacterial pathogens. Um, they attach to cells in a either specific or non-specific way. They then release chemicals to invade tissues. Once they're in there, they can use the nutrients that they can continually break down by uh, releasing more chemicals, more uh, enzymes, uh, to multiply and grow. So cell division is going to occur within the, within the tissues. Once they've invaded, the immune response will start uh, coming after them, and they'll either be affected by it and destroyed or not. They can potentially evade that response. As they continue uh, the infection, they'll be exposing the host cells and tissues to their toxins. And so they may have toxins that they release themselves into the environment around them. Those are called exotoxins, and they're almost always proteins. Uh, and they tend to be very potent, very virulent molecules that often cause lysis of cells, lysis of red blood cells, more lysis of the tissues, causing more widespread damage. Uh, the endotoxins don't cause as usually as, as much damage. Uh, they're not as virulent. They are part of the gram-negative cell wall, the outer cell wall, the lipopolysaccharides. Um, they're more stable in heat, whereas the exotoxins are not because of their, them being proteins. So uh, go over that. There's a couple of good things to read uh, on these topics uh, and the assigned reading. Um, uh, but the main thing is really just kind of the overview and the terms and the basics of, of some of these processes. And if you can have that, you'll, you'll pretty much have the, the, main, um, uh, the main points that you really need to take away uh, and then fo focus details on, say, some of the few examples I may have given of a particular enzyme, a particular type of molecule um, as an example. So kind of look at those, but don't necessarily um, 
you're not going to be required to go much further into that. Uh, whereas in your the book, it might list like 20 different types of um, other spreading factors as well. Um, you don't really need to go into to all of those.